I'll shout out the Incredible Holker, Dalen Holker, another tight end here. Yes. <laughs> the Incredible Holker is like whatever team accounts exist for wherever he goes. Like they're tweeting out like the Incredible Holker exclamation point, And then you're embedding the video of his preseason touchdown in the final preseason game against the Plumbers. You got to think of the. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one blindsided me. Rob was not ready for that one. We've all been there, folks. Watching preseason football at the end. Welcome to the opening bell of the NFL Stock Exchange Podcast. I'm Trevor Sikama. That is Connor Rogers. Joining you guys for, man, one of the final episodes until the big weekend itself. The 2024 NFL Draft is just over a week away. We got a lot of content to give you guys before then and during and after. We know we got all that. But, Connor, we've been talking about so many guys who've been going in the first round, right? We've been doing the Collab Mock Draft Series. We've given you some of our top 10s at every single position, sometimes top 30 if you watch the wide receiver episode. but Outside of those wide receivers, we haven't given a ton of love to some of the mid-round prospects. And so here on this episode today, we're doing just that. We're giving you each of our top 10, if you will, my guys for players that we think could be available on day three. Connor, I'm excited to get a little bit more in the weeds. You're finishing up the big board. I just wrapped mine up, which you can see over at pff.com. So I know that you're familiar with some of these guys that are a little bit further down the big board. So I'm excited to see who your 10 are today. Me too, man. It was funny when I was writing this list, I was like, damn, I have no idea what Trevor thinks of most of these guys because we haven't done the big board show, which we will. And I had, I'm excited for the big board show because I, I did have some updates since our final position rankings, not at wide receiver where we just did those 30, but a couple from a while back. And Mm. then I looked at this list I have today and I'm like, I have outside of two of the 10 I have, I have no idea what you think of any of these players. So this is this is one of the more unique shows we've done in a long time. Now, I'll just say this is a disclaimer for the people out there. There's probably a good chance that most of the guys we talk about are like fringe day two prospects, right? Like guys who yeah. maybe could go in the third round, but you know, just from the sheer number of all right, there's only 99 picks that you can have within the first three rounds. Some players that we think that are going to be available on day four. But the fact of the matter is, guys, once you start getting into the especially like the late fifth, sixth and seventh round, there's a reason why they're that low on the big board. So there's not like a ton to be able to say like, oh, love this guy. I think he could be. Oh, this guy's going to be the next Puka Nakua. Again, we make fun of that all the time because. Okay, if you thought he was going to be the next Puka Dakua, guess what? He's not going to go in the sixth round. So, if, if my you're dying words this- as I as I say <laughs> goodbye to my kids and grandkids, I go, "Who's the next Puka Nakua?" And they look <laughs> the at me and they go, "Who's that?" <laughs> and then oh, you're that's just amazing. Like, oh, I failed as a father. Um, so look, <laughs> I I thought about doing the structure of this is like, oh, we'll give one or two guys for each round. But then I thought of it, I was like. Who the hell am I going to talk about in round seven? Nobody wants to see that. There too. Players probably aren't going to be great. So I think this is a much better way to go through the exercise because it's those players that we still think can either be really good backups, a special teamers, or guys that we just believe might get picked lower in the draft, maybe because of athletic yeah. limitations or consistency or whatever, but maybe there is a path for them to start. So Connor, I'll let you kick it off, my friend. We'll go 10 each. Who do you want to bring to the table first? So I did this order randomly, right? You didn't like rank them as like my number no, one no, no, my no, guy. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I guess I shouldn't have said like top 10. I was just like 10 overall. You like scared me. I'm like, ah, I don't know where to go. <laughs> so, okay. I will try to group them position by position. So with that being I said, I'll start with uh, my first of two cornerbacks. And that would be Miles Harden from South Dakota, a player that I, I don't think we've talked about him. He's player 121 currently on my big board. Mm-hmm. He's about 5'11", 195. He's played actually over 1,200 snaps outside over the last three years compared to only 51 in the slot. But mm-hmm. I really like this guy moving to the slot at the NFL level. He's so competitive. He's a great, great aggressive tackler. I think in zone, he looks so comfortable. He reads the quarterback. He doesn't overreact to routes. Think of all the experience he has playing the position. Uh, there are some physical limitations if you want him to be an outside man-to-man cover corner. He doesn't have great length. He doesn't have great acceleration. 
Although, I mean, the level of competition he played at, you're not going to find a lot of tape where you go, this guy's overmatched. Uh, he's just that kind of talent, you know, at that level. Um, so I looked at him and said, slot corner or split field safety. I love the tackling and I love the awareness and I love the instincts. Uh, I was really, really impressed with this dude and, and couldn't wait to give him some love. So he is on my list. No he, way. He is, yeah, he is. He is one of my 10. So I, uh, I, I, I was wondering, because again, like, y'all, the reason why we like to do this setup this way is because I don't know who's on Connor's list. He doesn't know. We've never even talked list. about him ever. I know. I know. So I have him 151 on the big board, and I think that's too low. Like, I, yeah. I honestly, I, I feel like I should be a little bit closer to where you're at because a little bit of, of a background about this guy. So he plays at South Dakota, all right? Not south dakota state right like not like one of the no, powerhouses no, no. <laughs> in in the south dakota is like just regular ass south dakota all due respect and he was a zero star recruit coming out of high school and he really did not have a lot of offers i mean all, all of his offers are basically just fbs offers none of the or oh, sorry fcs offers none of the fbs offers nothing but when he got to south dakota it's like he was treated like a prize recruit getting it because he's from Hollywood, Florida. And they got, they got a, they got a dude who's playing football, high school football in the state of Florida, which is a hotbed for high school talent to come out to South Dakota and play for them. He started as a true freshman on that team. I think he started the last three games of that season. And he has been a starter at outside corner ever since. It is so funny that you talked about him in that way, where he's mainly played on the outside, but you can see him in the slot. I have the exact same evaluation for him because I've got some long speed concerns with this guy, but if you move him in the slot and you keep him off the line of scrimmage a little bit, I love his short area quickness. Like I love his body control. I love that explosiveness to trigger downhill. He's also really physical. He's a good tackler. He's just built really well. You could just see him be five, like five foot, 10 and a half, 195 pounds. Like he's just built like a corner man. And I think he does play the position at a pretty high level, especially against his competition at, at South Dakota. But I have to be honest in that if I saw long speed concerns with who you were going up against playing at South Dakota, I'm yeah. definitely going to see it at the NFL level. So that's why I agree. I think a move inside is, is appropriate for him, but somewhere in the fourth, fifth round, I think he could be a really nice prospect. So yeah, he was somebody who was on my list as well. All right. You want to kick off the next one? We'll kind of snake this list. Sure. Especially yeah, when the no, same guy. Yeah, that make that makes sense for me. So I'll stick with corner because um, I had another corner on here. You guys have heard me talk about this guy before, but it's Kalen Carson from Wake Forest. I, I was super high on him coming into the season. And when I was watching him during summer scouting, and this is something that I think is a, a cool part of the evaluation process. At different parts of the year, the more you watch somebody, sometimes you can get a different look at them. And when I watched him during the summer, all I could really focus on with Kalen Car Carson is, wow, you let him play off coverage a little bit, his click and close ability, his ability to trigger downhill, his willingness to go tackle you. I mean, he was in the, one of the best tackling corners that I watched over summer scouting. I, I, I might have had him somewhere around the top five when we were doing our top fives going into the season because I love that physical play style from him. Not afraid to stick his nose in there despite not being the biggest corner. But when I watched him during the season and then when I watched him kind of at the end of the season, I do see that long speed as a bit of an issue for him. And so that's why ah, the physical play style, loving to get hands on receivers, loving to be able to tackle near the line of scrimmage, all that's really great. But it's hard for me to say, yeah, go up close to the line of scrimmage and play press coverage. Because I think if an, a wide receiver gets anything near a clean release on him off the line of scrimmage, I mean, he'll be gone. He just doesn't have that type of recovery speed to keep up with, especially NFL receivers that he'll see uh, week in and week out if he's ever going to be a starter. He's got to kind of be that off coverage, probably cover three, but he could do some off man responsibilities as well, where you just let him anticipate and go get the wide receiver when he's breaking on the route and when the ball is coming his way. And I think he could be really physical in that regard. And just guys at the cornerback position who have that physical mentality to him, it's something that I love, and it's always something that I kind of gravitate towards. So, Kalen Carson, one of my guys in the summer. I'm not as high on him now. I still, I think he's probably going to be an early day three selection, but somebody that I still got a champion because I love his skill set and I love how he approaches the game. Yeah, Carson was in my top fifty, and I really like that you bring up the important conversation. Top one fifty. Hopefully, I said that right. Not top yeah, 50. you said you said top fifty, and I was about to say 
She's no, 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 okay. No. Top top 150. Whoa. I, good thing I caught yeah. that. Yeah, I think for him, you brought up a really important conversation around corner that gets lost a lot is you can be a, sp- a scheme specific corner and that's going to greatly impact your value for better or for worse on different boards. And I think it's what makes our job very difficult at times is finding the sweet landing spot for guys like that because there might be what this is. I'm just ballparking this like what so there's like five teams that really value the traits of a cover three corner but Mm -hmm. you like the guy a little bit more but he slides a little bit because four of those teams feel good about their corner room at that point of the draft and then the one team takes him in the sixth round but he really might be a fourth round player based off talent it's the draft process is very um intricate at times for that reason there's just so many flavors and types of teams across the nfl in all three phases of the game and when you do this from the big picture, that's what makes it really, really interesting of why you might be higher or lower on guys. And it kind of segues to my next guy, my other corner as well. And that's Kamal Haddon from Tennessee, a guy oh, that's yeah. tall, yep. pretty big, fast. What an interesting player in this draft, because he to me, he looked like one of the most improved defenders in the country. When you look at 2022 to 2023, the problem, oh, yeah. Trevor, is at the end of October, He gets a season ending shoulder injury and that's that it's a wrap. Mm -hmm. He has not done a lot throughout this process. He did get to test after the combine. Um, The testing was okay. Notably the one five, one 10 yard split, which there's a lot of burst on tape. So it's not surprising. He's very fast in that zero to 20. He did run a unofficial four, five, nine in the 40. So he got under that four, six mark, but that's not great long speed. Keep in mind, this is somebody that, is a true six one. He's going to play closer to 200 pounds. So mm-hmm. I think with Haddon, what I really liked and why I would take him on day three is that he puts himself to, in position to make plays on the ball with that burst. He had five interceptions and 14 forced incompletions over his last 16 games. He's experienced in press coverage. He's experienced in off man coverage. He knows how to read the quarterback. Total enigma as a tackler. Like when he's when it's a screen, He has a sixth sense and he's aggressive and he makes massive plays in the screen game. When it's an outside run, he's a liability. It doesn't. It's so weird to me that you can be like you dial it up to almost a nine and a half against screens. But the outside Mm -hmm. run, I legitimately think he's a liability. So in those eight games from this year, if you're listening and you haven't watched Haddon, watch his season this year. I thought he was a big shutdown outside corner. If he doesn't get hurt, part of me thinks we might be talking about him as a bona fide day two pick, but that's not happening because of the injury. So I'm really fascinated to see where this goes for him. Yeah. Oh, he's he's not in my top top 10 that we're going to talk about here today, but certainly somebody who I know a lot of people out there are going to be willing to take a flyer on. He's had a winding college football journey. You, you mentioned he played at Tennessee yeah. this past year, but just out of high school, zero star recruit coming out of Michigan, the state of Michigan, that is. Um, initially set to attend Central Michigan out of high school, but his grades did not allow him to qualify to go play at Central Michigan. So he had to go to Independence Community College, which was the JUCO that was in. We know that name. You, I think. I think. It, I think that was the. It was that the no that was East Mississippi was the first two seasons. Independence was I think the third season for Last Chance U. That sounds um, right. Played one season there, transferred to Auburn, uh, but he only spent the spring at Auburn before then transferring in the summer to Tennessee of 2021. So he's kind of been there ever since. And he's been like a spot starter, fill-in dude over the last two years. And then 2023, he was a full-time starter. And like you mentioned, it was his best year yet, especially as a coverage player. Um, He's got some really good numbers for our stable uh, stable metrics, which project to the next level pretty well. But you mentioned, I mean, there's definitely some weaknesses there for him. I think the footwork's kind of out of control. Um, it was a little bit better in 2023. It was not good in 2022. So he did get a little bit better in that area. The hand technique and like the what wh- he he understands like he's big and long and he needs to get hands on guys. But like it, sometimes it was the wrong hand. Like he was he was throwing the inside hand when he really needed to throw the outside hand and vice versa. Like he just didn't understand where he was with leverage, where the receiver was going, and how to actually press correctly so that's still a big work in progress for him and dude you mentioned the tackling like he's not just a liability and run support like he's a he's a liability to him to his health when he's tackling sometimes i mean <laughs> I I this laugh, dude will it's... completely dip his head and just launch at defenders with the crown of his helmet i mean he's staring at the ground 
It's like, dude, you're going to get yourself hurt. So not only is he missing tackles because of that, because he's not keeping his eyes on the target, I mean, he's putting himself in danger. So like that, that worried me too about him. But uh, obviously I think there's a lot of like natural talent and ability from him. It's just a, uh, yeah, it, ma- it makes sense why he would be on this kind of a list, right? Because of what we Without saw in 2023, but then he's got the injury and all that. Um, it's like, let me take a flyer. If I have a good defensive backs coach that knows how to coach technique, this guy was built to play outside corner the way he can like turn and run and play the ball and anticipate. But you're a hundred percent right. Trevor. There's a reason why he's going on day three of the draft. So here's, here's another player for me. Um, not a cornerback. I, I don't have any more corners. So I don't know if you had more corners, but I'm no, I, that, that wraps it up for corners. Blake Watson, the halfback slash wide receiver out of Memphis. Is he on your list? I'm glad you brought him up. He's not on my list, but he was dangerously close. He's kind of been a a hot name in the month of April for the draft after not getting the combine invite. So it took me a really long time to sit down and actually do him for the draft guy. Well, I I watched Um, the non-combine guys last. And right, I don't know about you, but like, yeah. So when I watched him over the summer, I'm not going to lie, like didn't really like him. Didn't really yeah. know like a ton about him. Just didn't really love the tape. Didn't really see a difference maker. And the reason is, you know, you go back and you kind of learn more about this guy, especially when you're doing a deep, when I was doing deep dives for the draft guide. So he was a two-star wide receiver recruit, all right? He played halfback at Memphis over the last couple of years, but he was a wide receiver recruit, played wide receiver for the first two years of, of college football at Old Dominion before switching over to playing running back in 2021 and 2022. Then he transfers over to Memphis. So this past year he played at Memphis and he played the running back position, but holy cow, like he was good (laughs) this past year. I mean, I love this dude's skill set. So he measured in, I think around like 5'9", 190 is the measurables for this guy. The athletic testing that he had at his pro day because you mentioned he was a combine snub for a lot of people who wasn't invited to Andy four nine sorry four three nine forty yard dash 92nd percentile 135 inch broad jump which is 99th percentile oh his jumps were nuts and a 41 and a half inch vert which is a 97th percentile this dude was a crazy athlete and the best part is he's not just this reckless lateral no not lateral i should say linear like explosive yeah. north to south type of an athlete like he is controlled like he has a lot of really great body control and in fact some of the best parts of watching him on film is his stop start ability like what he can do in, in the open field making guys miss and i think his force miss tackle number was pretty high because of it yeah force miss tackles per attempt over the last two years so this includes 2022 so 2023 was even better probably carrying a lot of this 0.32 to um this tackles force per attempt that's 96 percentile and then you're thinking about a, a wide receiver converted to running back all right well he's probably not going to be that physical for you yards after contact per attempt 4.12 93rd percentile this guy's good <laughs> adequate yeah. nfl explosiveness explosiveness both linear and lateral ample receiving experience and nuance how to be a pass catcher out of the backfield really impressive body control to stop on a dime you know i think the vision as a back carrying it out of the backfield is still obviously a work in progress for him, but you see him when he's operating behind mid zone or outside zone plays when he's really, when the flow gets to go to the sideline and he kind of gets to become this one cut playmaker. That's when he really shines. So if you give me Blake Watson in the fourth round for a zone blocking scheme team, I, I'm, I think you got a really nice offensive weapon on your yeah. hands. So Watson from Cleveland Memphis took, all took, day. Dude, took me way too long to get to him, but I like him, man. He's one of my dudes that I'd, I'd stand on the table for in day three. I haven't stacked him on my board yet, but I did start watching him because he's on that list of non-combine guys that I have to get done for the draft. And when I pulled up the RAS for him, I was like, oh, like I'm expecting some things here. I'm yes. and, and I, I looked up the usage. I looked up the RAS and I tapped into about one game. So I'm not even close to done, but there is something there. And I'm, I'm really glad you brought him up on the show. I have to have this guy on the show and I'll be quick because this is somebody I have talked about a lot. Tyrone mm-hmm. Tracy Jr. Like just has to oh, be on this boy. list for me. I can't not yeah. have him on this list. I, now it's, it's not as fun anymore. It feels like the, the, you know, the, 
party is kind of out. The secret's out of this one. I still think he's going on day three. So I felt like it was apt to have him on this. But yeah, I mean, real quick, if you haven't listened to us talk about him, started out as a wide receiver for Iowa, blossomed as a running back transfer for Purdue, playmaker in both the run and pass game, creates his own yards like, I mean, slippery jukes, very good contact balance, strong runner, pretty explosive player. Uh, Tracy is somebody that, is really some really could have a better NFL career than college career because he's a late bloomer at what he was asked to do. And you want to bring up, you know, kind of go piggyback off of your your rant just now. You want to look at relative athletic score nine seven eight for Tracy. I mean, he he is about six feet tall, almost six feet tall. He's two hundred ten pounds. He runs sub four five. Uh, the agilities were insane, like out of this world, a six, eight, one, three cone and a four Oh six shuttle. You're looking at like, that's not as good as it gets, but dang close, honestly, right. To right. Uh, agilities jump 40 inches in the vert. I mean, 10, four broad, like basically his explosive grades and agility grades were elite, elite, elite. And his speed was really, really good. And he's not small, which I just, when you go deeper and deeper into the draft, when you watch day three guys, it's always, wow, I like this player. He's really small. Wow, I like this player. He's really small. <laughs> and that's why they're being projected that way. With right. Tracy, he's got bell cow back build or borderline bell cow back build with elite athleticism and is a late convert to the position. And he brings the receiver traits with him, which is catching the ball, blocking, running of advanced route tree. Um, maybe it's just to the point now where he's not a day three player anymore. When you, when you hear, you know, people talk about him like that, but I, I still expect him to go in the fourth round. And I think he's going to be one hell of a pro. Also I one of my have, favorite personalities in the entire class. Full transparency. I have, I have, I have Watson ahead of Tracy, but they're very close, right? I mean, it's sort of a very similar story, right? They're both former yeah. wide receivers turned running backs. And so it's kind of, I, I hear a lot of people who like Tracy, a lot you are one of those people and obviously I, I agree with you i think that he's going to be a day three guy but he's fun i mean he's a true he, he does we talked about this on the running back show like he does not look like a running back but when you give this guy the ball out of the backfield he just makes plays for you he's like this backyard recess type of a i'm the right. best athlete on the field and that's just kind of i don't know how he plays and it's a little unorthodox and it looks a little bit rec- reckless but he makes it happen he gets a lot of yards out of it had a player comp for him. Uh, Tevin Ooh. Coleman was my player comp for him. Okay. Yeah, a little All bit right. of a different one. Coleman was somebody that, you know, Kyle Shanahan always knew how to really use. I thought he was an underrated pass catching threat, an incredible athlete. Um, that's who Tracy reminded me of. So I don't, I don't hate it. All right. And they're very similar. I mean, like a little bit taller, six foot one, you know, yeah. 210 pounds. But I think the same measurable explosive. is very much the same for these guys. Yeah. Nice. All right, cool. I like it. I like it. I'll, I'll I'll stay on the running back train. I think this is the last running back I have. Yeah, this is the last running back that I have. I got to shout out Cody Schrader from Missouri. Um, he is on my list as, as somebody who is just kind of a day three favor for me. And it's because if y'all have been listening to this show or my draft takes for long enough, you'll remember how high I was on Tyler Algier when he was coming out. I had him as RB3 uh, in that class. Um, actually, let me... Where... Where did we stack up with that running back class? Because that was two years ago. That was the 2022 draft. Let me see which running backs I had above him. Because obviously it was only those two guys. What it would have been, it would have been Brees and Kenneth, right? Yeah. yeah. So I had I had Kenneth Walker as RB1. I had Brees Hall as RB2, but they were, I mean, they were separated by like, I think three spots in my big board or something like that. So they're right there with one another. And then I had Tyler Algier as RB3 simply because I love the style. Like he was somebody who was going to give me his all at every point that I was going to put him on the field. Every single carry, every single rep, he was going to give me everything that he had. And that to me is how Cody Schrader runs. He's not as big as Tyler Algier was. So Algier got picked in the, uh, what, third, was he a third round pick? No, he was a fifth round pick. So he was, he was a day three guy too. But they have the same mentality when it comes to taking the ball out of the backfield. Okay. Schrader, his journey, zero star recruit, same thing. Didn't really have a lot of offers coming out of high school. Ended up going to Truman State University, uh, which is a D2 school. Was there for four years, redshirted, was kind of a backup for two years. 
got into the main rotation. And then his last year when he was at Truman State, he led the NCAA in rushing with over 2,000 rushing yards. Okay. After that season, he walks on at Missouri. Like, again, like could have probably gone elsewhere, decided to walk on at Missouri. The first year that he was there for a walk on, he was kind of just earning his place on the team. Last year was his first year as a full time starter. And what did he do? Oh, he led the SEC in rushing. Like, this guy now in two different spots has led the conference that he has played in in rushing. One of them was in the SEC. So he's somebody who he's not as flexible as these other backs. He doesn't have the best long speed, but God damn, he'll put down his shoulder and he will just run through anybody that is in front of him. He will give you everything that he has on every single carry. And to me, Give me those types of players. Yeah. Those are the guys that are going to work for you on special teams. Those are the guys that it's, it is those players who, if you got to cut them and put them on a practice squad at any point in time, those are the hard knocks clips where the coach just goes, I wish so badly we could have you on this roster. And that might be Cody Schrader's story for his first couple of years. But I also think that there is a path to where eventually this guy might work his way through a good situation where maybe he's splitting carries at some point in time for one year, two years, or whatever it is. Because his style is just so hard to deny, and it's something that every coach and every teammate is going to want want for him. So um, Cody Schrader from Missouri, had to shout him out. He's my last running back that I got on this list. It feels like him and Isaiah Davis from South Dakota State fit that mold. They are just going to run downhill, run through you, give you everything they got. On You need those early downs. It's not always going to be pretty, but you could turn around and hand them the football and grind out really, really tough yards. So uh, I like that call by you. I didn't have a second running back, so we could switch positions here. Dealer's choice. And I'll move over. I do have four offensive linemen on this list out of the 10. Uh, uh, oh, dang. I have one, two... Uh, and then maybe three. I could probably shout out another three because we had, uh, we both had, who do we both have? Miles Harden on here, so I might have three, but go ahead. We'll, we'll do offensive line now. Let's hear it. All right. So I'll start with KT Leviston from Kansas oh, well, State. He was my, he what? was my alternate. <laughs> I was going to bring un- up from Miles Unbelievable. Harden. Unbelievable. He's the guy, and this is even better that, that you are now in this club. I, when I text people that either, coach offensive line in the league or coach offensive line like and just like doing this and are mm-hmm. he's always the guy that it's like the spider-man meme or the handshake emoji everybody has the same response like yep i saw it the same way and clearly you do too leviston was kansas state's left tackle playing next to cooper bb and it's almost like nobody cared about him but they should he is such an easy transition to guard and i don't think that it's there are guys where it's like no shot they could play a day of tackle in the nfl leviston's not that it's not that i don't Mm -hmm. think he has zero chance at tackle it's just that i really like his utilization at guard he is thick he is nasty he's about 6'4 326 he's at his best when they tell him fire off the ball and block downhill generate explosive power move your targets off the line of scrimmage he loves to finish his opponents to the ground uh, he does such a good job unlocking power from his hips, which is a really important aspect of playing guard, not always tackle. But I think the pad level is not always perfect, and that can you know kind of hinder the power at times. He was pretty good in inside zone, uh, but his hand play he his hands get a little wild. He can be a little bit of he's a brawler. He wants to come out and kind of throw his haymakers at you, and sometimes he'll miss. Mm-hmm. He's got long arms. So I saw him, you know, rushers try to beat that outside shoulder and he can the lower half doesn't have the agility to always recover. But when you got long arms, you can kind of reach and slow guys down. Um, I really like this guy a lot. I think he's such good guard depth. I think if you're running a lot of inside zone and, and gap concepts like he's somebody that'll just grow on you that by year two, I could I could see GMs and coaches being like, man, we had Leviston like kind of sitting in rice last year. He got a year as a, a, you know, he's, he was a backup, but this year we're going to go into camp and we think he's going to push to start. He's that kind of guy to me. And another guy I've heard, I've heard really good things on the DNA and it doesn't surprise me with the way he plays. There's a lot of passion and intensity. 
Uh, he's 129 on my big board. And every day I wake up, I find myself being like, yeah, maybe two spots higher, maybe two spots higher. I, I think Leviston it should be a fourth round pick. And I just I, what a fan. I was just such a fan of watching this player. I remember when we back to when we went back to summer scouting, um, I remember watching Cooper BB and obviously I'm not the highest on Cooper BB, but when I watched Kansas state, I was like, all right, who's the other guy? Like, who's like next and to I, him? <laughs> and, right. And that's, and that's KT Levison. And I just found myself saying that multiple times. I was like, okay, but what about this dude? Like, why are we not talking about this other guy? Um, maybe not as high as BB was, but again, I think it was probably because he was left tackle and, and, Maybe you see like the hand usage you mentioned. I, I think the hands are all over the place. Like they're not nearly as inside. They're they're super wide a lot. He's also got low hands a lot, which kind of exposes his chest and gives him a little bit of trouble. But sometimes I almost feel like he invites it. Like he wants people to like think, hey, like let's go straight Try at this me. guy. And then he does, you know, I, I I don't know what the exact technique is called, but when you have lower hands, it's not necessarily because you're lazy. Like sometimes it is a technique thing, right? Because sometimes you want to you want to swing your hand. Well, you don't want to swing your hands too far back, but if they're low, you can scoop them up, right? And and you can you can go immediately up and under to get into the chest or into you know the armpit or the the shoulder pads to be able to latch on, and that's kind of an easy and direct path that allows you to do that. So everybody out there, when you see lower hands, it's not always like, hey, he's lazy, he's got to fix this. Sometimes it is a little bit of a technique that they prefer, but there are also times when I watch guys very clearly do that that I go, okay, well, it's getting you in trouble too much. So maybe you do need to have your hands a little bit higher. Like I kind of, I kind of think that with Olu Fashino a little bit. I think that there with are, Sue Matia. There are plenty of times when you're, they're carrying really low hands and you can see it on some reps where the hands are coming up exactly the way that they're intended to. But again, like, especially with Fashino where you kind of struggle with anchor here and if you'll watch the Ohio State game, a lot of times they realize the reason why JT Sui Malo, Tui Malo out and the reason why Jack Sawyer were able to push him around a little bit is because they can get into the chest. They actually got up into the chest. So that's something that you just got to think about. Anyways, Levison's great. I mean, he's such a fantastic mauler. He wants to move guys against their will. That's exactly what you want as an offensive lineman. So I love that you shouted him out. It's hilarious that you had Harden on your list. And then my first reserve was going to be to talk about Leviston. And there, uh, now we got him off of, off of the list as well. I'll stick with O-line for my next guy. Um, Penn State right tackle, Caden Wallace, is, is on my list here. Four-year starter for Penn State. Good size, good athleticism. I just think that he does everything at a really solid level. Now, there are times when I watch him and okay, maybe he doesn't have elite foot speed and quickness to really protect his outside shoulder and his outside hip from some of the best speed rushers that he goes up against. And maybe when he's running power, or trying to move people against their will, maybe he's not the strongest guy, but he's got a really high floor. And I think that he's solid at everything. I really do. I also think that his game and his size can be interchangeable from from tackle to guard. And he started at le- at right tackle for the last four years for Penn State. So he's only ever been a right tackle for him. But I really do see this all-around ability where, to me, Wallace is the ultimate draft in the first in, in the fourth round, and he is your swing offensive lineman. Like he is your he is your sixth man off the bench. He is the guy who could basically come in. I don't know if you want to play in center, but you know, he could come in and probably help you out in a pinch on the right side or the left side at tackle or at guard. So just a really good all around game from him. Like again, I said a ton of experience, adequate athleticism, adequate build from Caden Wallace. Um, So that combination of those two things, the ceiling, the ultimate ceiling is probably why you're a little bit further down and probably why he's going to be a day three pick. But um, I really like him as a reserve dude. If you got this guy again, as your sixth offensive lineman, I, I think that you're you're sleeping pretty good at night, knowing if something goes wrong, he can fill in for you, and it's not going to be a catastrophe. Another guy in my top 150. So I, I think you know I like the value on Caden Wallace. I think because of the program he played at with all those big time prospects, he kind of fell under the radar throughout this year. I'll pair my next two together because I'm not going to say they're the same caliber player because I have one much higher than the other. But you want to talk about undersized athletic interior players. How about Tanner Bordellini 
from Wisconsin and Dylan okay. McMahon from NC State. Now, Bordellini, I have much closer to... I should probably just search him instead of being a total idiot and wasting everyone's time. <laughs> Player 133. And he's kind of one of those guys that I find myself like I go back and I'm like, ah, man, I could see it at times. And then McMahon will be outside the top 150 because I, I think there's some questions there with the overall size profile. But I'll start with Bordellini quick. I mean, Trevor, this was somebody that is just an upper echelon athlete at the position. Now, he's an interesting one because he's played tackle before and then he's, he's played both guard spots. And then this year. He played all his snaps as the starting center for Wisconsin. Now he's only 303 pounds. He is six foot four and a half, so he's tall. He lacks the typical mass for an interior NFL offensive lineman, but he makes mm-hmm. up for that by being an elite athlete, elite testing, mm-hmm. elite play speed on tape. He's quick off the ball. He's a natural mover in space. He catches his targets. He uses that momentum to kind of launch into targets. It's not going to be Bordellini's game when it's close quarters and the nose tackle is 340 pounds and strong and long and like he's going to get in trouble there. But when you think of what Miami does in the run game and these teams that don't mind having undersized linemen that are just so much more athletic, he's going to beat linebackers to the spot. He is going to be a great climber, a great puller. I think he's once again a guy that if you're that kind of scheme, you want him as your backup this year and you think you could develop into a starter. I thought McMahon had some of the similar qualities, but is a longer shot just because that play strength is always going to be tough at his size as well. So these were kind of my day three. Hey, they're not the biggest guys in the world, but I think they can legitimately be backup centers in the league that can they get a little bit bigger and stronger? And eventually some of those deficiencies go down while their athleticism covers up so much for what we want to do in the run game. I'm really fascinated to see how the league values these two. Yeah, I'm 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 much higher on Bordellini than I am McMahon. I, and I that's agree. how it'll go. Yeah. You, like, you, you I, kind it's of, like probably like a 60 to 80 spot difference for me right now. Yeah, I've got I mean, I think McMahon will get drafted, but but we're looking do, like round seven. Right, right. Whereas yeah. Bordellini, I think, again, could be a four to five four, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that he could absolutely be a fourth round pick. I think that that's that's well within the realm of possibility. Both of these guys, the weaknesses are sort of they read the same, but they're more extreme, I think, for McMahon. Uh, Bordellini is more athletic, and I think that he knows how to make up for those strength deficiencies and length deficiencies, whereas I think McMahon's extremely quick. You know, I think he's an extremely quick offensive lineman, but he's kind of the he's when I watched him, it was like, all right, ball gets snapped, hands come up very quick. You love to see that. He gets up into a dude very quickly. I mean, ball gets snapped, his hands are basically up in the chest of the nose tackle. And you can see it immediately off the off the snap, the nose tackle will sometimes be like, whoa, okay. And yeah. they'll just like get knocked back probably a step. But then they'll go, okay. They you almost turn into like Big Brother a little bit, where they go, okay. Well, now it's time. For Why are you climbing back. on me? Yeah, get right. off and, me. And then, and it's so it's like that initial quickness and jolt can be valuable, but it's it's tough because it's it's really hard for him to maintain uh, that sort of punch of contact. And so, um, yeah, yeah, that's I, that's kind of how I see those dudes. No, I love your breakdown. McMahon's a little bit like how Kendrick Green was coming out, where you're like, damn, he is athletic, but he is so small. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to sneak in a, a true seventh rounder on this list. All my other guys are, like you said at the top, I'm thinking fourth to fifth round. Uh, maybe some could sneak in a day two. McMahon is by far the lowest graded, but a guy I'm just, I find myself rooting for. I really sure. do. I just find myself, I'm like, man, I hope he could figure it out and make it and hang on a roster for a while. I got one offensive lineman, but before I get to that, uh, anybody out there, if you got a family, you got to protect them with term life insurance. It's one of the smartest financial decisions that you're ever going to make. And this time of year is the perfect time of year to get it done. So you can focus on whatever the rest of the year and a great summer has in store for you and your family. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policies in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies that will fit your family's budget with quality policies like million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Your personalized quote in just minutes and apply whenever it is convenient for you all online into your schedule. You go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. 
Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family and apply today in just minutes at mefabric.com slash stock exchange, M-E-E-T fabric.com slash stock exchange. If you go to M-E-A-T fabric.com slash stock exchange, it'll take you right to our offensive line top 10 position rankings. Uh, policies are issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company, not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. So my last offensive lineman that I wanted to get to was um, Matt Gonzalez. The offensive tackle from Pittsburgh. Uh, look, I don't know. I don't know if everybody's going to love him because he's not an elite athlete. He's a little light in the pants, you know. It's it's it, it's it's just like he needs he needs a little bit more weight in the lower half. But I just think he's so smart with how he plays the game. Like I just think he's such a smart offensive lineman. The hands are always in a great place. I love the grip strength from this dude. Um, when he gets his hands on him and inside, I mean, he is not letting go. It's I, I watched him and I was like, damn, I, it's basically like Graham Barton and this guy for grip strength. I feel like with with how much it really stood out for me. I'm a little bit worried with his foot speed when it comes to staying a tackle at the NFL level, and he doesn't exactly have the size of the build to be able to play at guard. So I think he might just be a. I think he might just mostly be a backup at the NFL level. But when I watched him, I could not help but think this might be the guy who just doesn't test great, maybe doesn't have the most beautiful body for an offensive tackle, but is just steady starter for years in the league. I don't know. That's that's what I felt like I was watching when I was watching um, Gonzalez at, over the last couple of years. And um, he got hurt this year at the beginning of the year, so we didn't even get to yeah. full, see a full year from him, which sucked. But uh, I just I love how he approaches the game. I feel like he's got good patience. He's got good hand usage. He's so smart with where he needs to position himself to go up against different types of edge rushers, whether it's power or speed, even to make up for some of his deficiencies. So how well he understands himself and his game and what he does well, it was really hard for me to watch him and think, man, you're, this guy's just not going to make it in the pros. I think at the very least, he's going to be a – very serviceable backup that you're happy to have on your football team. So um, Gonzalez is the the last guy that I've got in my group. And shout out to you for nailing the pronunciation. That has been an elusive pronunciation. I know. Well, shout out to uh, Dane Brugler for the beast of his draft guide because he had the pronunciation in there. And obviously Dane's draft guide is one of the must have pieces of draft information yeah. every single year. It's because of things like this where Dane dives super deep and even to the point where he's going to make sure that you are pronouncing the pronouncing these guys name correctly. That. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's just why Dane is simply one of the best in the business. There's no doubt about it. But um, yes, that's uh, Gonzalez is my uh, is my last offensive lineman that we have here on this list. All right. My last offensive lineman, as I just I went a little too ham on the O line, making four of ten here. Uh, Nathan Thomas from Ooh, Louis, right. Louisiana, the Raysian Cajuns. I, this guy's got a little and maybe because he just got a lot of money and maybe because he played at the same college, but he's got a little Kevin Dotson in his game. Yeah, you watch, baby. I like it's it. Like, it's like, ooh, I don't think this is because you wear the same college uniform. I just think this is how these guys might be coached. Thomas. Now, Thomas is just like Leviston to me. Lesser, though, because I think Leviston can has a he could survive a game at tackle. Thomas, there is no way I'm playing him at tackle at the next level, despite no, him a being a two. Yeah, he's a guard. He's a two year starter at left tackle for the Raging Cajuns. His skill set and density is guard. Six five, three thirty two. You want to talk about bringing the beef? Not a lot of agility, not a lot of adjustments in pass pro on an island, but the strength and force, the way this guy can handle power. He's somebody that will be able to un drop his hips get power against interior rushers if you kick him inside. If you want to be like the Raiders were last year, like man-heavy downhill run game, and we see the Rams converting to this, which is really, really interesting. We're seeing Shanahan do a little bit of this. Uh, the league likes to kind of, you know, counterpunch. Everyone was zone, zone, zone forever. Now we're seeing downhill football return. Mm -hmm. This is your guy. Like, this is your guy. When the game's a cage fight, Thomas is who you want as your tag team partner in the cage. Tough guy. He can absolutely bury you. He can explode off the ball. Um, I really, really liked him. I, I really did. I, I just, I, he's one of my projections where I'm like, it doesn't always look pretty at tackle, especially in pass pro. He gave up a handful of sacks this year. But 
a little bit like Anthony Bradford, who was drafted to the Seahawks out of LSU. Uh, if you really want the higher, higher end, I mean, I brought up Dotson, just that wide body, big hands, strong as an ox, snow plow in the downhill running game. He's he's a fun one, man. So here's my strength and weaknesses, and it's funny, you know, you listen to these strength and weaknesses, and it's so easy to see. Well, why don't you just kick him inside? All right, strengths. Powerful offensive tackle who has the mentality of a man gap blocker. Good core strength to stay balanced and blocked through twists and turns. Finisher's mentality who wants to bury his defenders or walk them to the sideline. Can anchor very well versus speed to power moves. Weaknesses. Not very fleet of foot. You won't want him on wide zone blocking too often. Heavy slow feet and pass pro leaves his inside shoulder susceptible. Kick slide footwork is not very balanced. There's an easy way to mitigate all of those things and <laughs> and, and make the and make the strengths shine even more. Get ready to learn guard, kick, buddy. Kick that man inside, and he is going to thrive for you. So um, I agree. I, I like that the Kevin Dotson shout out is a nice one because I could definitely see the similarities that um, are reminiscent. Sometimes, yeah, okay, maybe you're watching the same journey and it can't help but if something clicks. But I do think that the Kevin Dotson. Um, parallel and the comp makes sense i really do i like that one so i'll do i'll do two kind of in a group here for this next one because i like both of them for similar reasons and i think they're both sort of limited to day three players for similar reasons um sion sioni vaki the safety from utah a guy that i have really enjoyed throughout this process and then why does no one like him we'll get into vaki not to cut you off go ahead and then Mar- Maris Leifo, uh from, from mm-hmm. Notre Dame, their linebacker. These are like two these. guys who love their power profiles. So, sort of these throwback players where, you know, as with Vaki being more of a downhill strong safety and with Leifo being this sort of like tone setting middle linebacker, when it comes time to hit, all right. When it comes time to crack the pads, what football is all about, give me these two dudes. They will never shy away from contact. They will hit you with good pop for their size. Um, I think they've both got great downhill and sideline to sideline speed. The thing that kind of I think is a hang up from them being ranked a little bit higher or maybe even talked about as so, uh, a late day two pick is I think both of these guys – struggle to anticipate as well as they could and then also struggle to react as fast as they need to when they don't anticipate so it's one of those things where you kind of just watch them and you go well if you're a step slow in college a step slow in the nfl can sometimes be three steps slow and now you're out of position and now you're not really where we need you to be so maybe that's something that kind of can develop for both of those guys especially for vaki because vaki was coming out of high school in 2019 he was in the 2019 recruiting class but he went on a two-year church mission immediately after that. So he technically was in the 2021 recruiting class for Utah. And he was there for two years. 2023, he gets a lot of time playing as a safety. They even flip him over to running back and needed him to play running back for two games. But that just shows you how all around of an athlete this guy is and you know how well he sees space and how um how physical he wants to be. I mean, he was he was cracking the pads even when he was on offense. And so for both of these guys. I think both of them, at the very least, will be good depth players and special teamers for you because they're not going to be afraid to do what they need to do physically to make a roster. But in order for them to become more of these maybe full-time, if a full-time starting opportunity comes up and the way that they can truly take that by the horns is by being better at that anticipation side of things. Cause I think a lot of the rest of it is there for them. So those are two guys that they're going to be my guys on day three. I'm going to be happy for them wherever they go. Cause I'm excited to really see them play and develop at the NFL level. But that's how I see both of those guys, the strengths, the weaknesses and why they're probably going to be maybe third or sorry, fourth, fifth rounders instead of maybe sneaking into that third round. What I love about both of them is they always want to be around the ball. There's not a play where yeah. they're not just dying to be involved in. And you you said it. They like to bring uh they like to play in contact. They like to, you know, obviously hit. They are and Baki, it's funny we've joked about it because he played running back, but he wants to be a hitting safety. So yeah, that's what you love about those guys, is that they just want to be in on every single play. All right. My next one here, speaking of that, Jordan McGee, linebacker from Temple. I mean, this oh, yeah. is someone, yeah, this is somebody that is just all gas, tons of energy, not big, 6'1", 228, smart, 
plays fast, plays hard. Temple used him as a blitzer. Uh, he was very effective as a, down, a blitzer because he has downhill speed. He was tasked with lining up everyone around him, like the coaching staff, really, really trusted and loved this guy. Yeah, he's smaller, so if you want him playing in the middle of the field, he'll get stuck on blocks at times. I want him in a scheme where it's, hey, run and chase. Let you play in space. Big guys in front of you. Open up that space. And I think he'll be a really, really good special teamer with the type of play speed he has and the type of mindset he has. McGee is every bit of a modern-day linebacker. I don't think he gets drafted until day three, but full transparency, he's linebacker five for me in this draft. I am very, very high on the Temple product. Also, lower on the linebacker class if he's not going to get drafted until day three and he's, he's LB5. Man, I do not like this linebacker class. Um, you know, I, I do like McGee too. You know, I, I think that um, something to emphasize about him is that he is he earned a single digit number at Temple the last two years, which at Temple, it's not just like, oh, we'll give you a single digit number because it's cool. You have to earn yeah, a single digit number. That's cool. And I, that is cool. And I believe it's either the coaching staff or it might be the players have to vote on it. They have to vote for who gets single digit numbers at Temple. I know they all loved him. Like rave it, reviews for this guy across the board. And the reason why you earn that single digit number, it's not just for the best players. They're not like, okay, vote for who you think the best player on the team is. It's leadership and it's toughness. Like that is the characteristic that they use for this. So McGee being a smaller linebacker, I think he played safety in high school. No, he played quarterback in high school. He, no, no, yeah, yeah. He he played quarterback in high school. Because I remember this. I remember writing his scouting report not too long ago, and I remember writing that he is like the quarterback of the defense, playing as a middle linebacker because he's so good at communication. He's so good at getting everybody where they need to be. He was a two-time captain for Temple. And yeah, he played, he did. He played quarterback and safety in high school. I just looked it up right here. Yep. So he, those are the positions that he played. And now he's playing linebacker. And he's the centerpiece of the defense because he's playing defense. And yeah, I mean, he's just somebody who, again, you mentioned, you want on your football team. I don't know if he's ever going to be a starting linebacker at the NFL level, but he's going to be a hell of a depth piece for you. He's going to be a great bottom of the 53-man roster for you. He'll be a great special teamer for you. And that's like, I'm listing off the things at worst that he is going to be. Yeah, great at point. At best, you know, at best, yeah, I don't know. Maybe he gets a little bit be- bigger, a little bit faster from some NFL strength and conditioning, and he can become somebody that can be a nice linebacker three for you at the NFL level. So I do like him. Um, I got to shout out Taj Washington, the wide receiver from USC, as, uh, as as one of my guys on day three to really prioritize. I'll, I'll start by saying this. Yeah, I get it. He's small, <laughs> very small. He is below... 10th percentile in basically every single measurement category. Height, weight, wingspan, arm length, hand size. Pretty sure he is below 10th percentile in all of those things. But he is somebody who just knows how to get open. He is an elite separator. He stood out big time during Shrine Bowl practices, basically against any sort of cornerback. And there were some good ones that were there. It was basically just him and Malik Washington. We talk about Malik Washington because he's a little bit bigger as like a, oh yeah, he's going to be like a day two pick. Like he's going to be a third round pick. And we talk about Malik Washington. Well, I should just say not enough. We don't talk about him enough. His PFF is sort of developing an athletic score metric uh, that we've been gathering the data for for a while now. And we've been able to see it kind of on the on the PFF ultimate tool side. And Taj Washington is one of the higher in-game athleticism score players that we have at the wide receiver position in this really good wide receiver class. So he's got that really good in-game athleticism, elite body control. It is sort of like a Tank Dell situation where I think this guy is really, really talented. I just don't know how durable he's going to be. But when he's on the field, I don't really have a worry that he can separate and that he can be an effective player who can create a throwing window for you. So if health is on his size... If if health is on his side, <laughs> I like that. Uh, he can be somebody who I think could even be a, a contributor at the NFL level as a wide receiver three or wide receiver four. So yeah, I compared him to Greg Dortch. I mean, returner, backup slot, same size, sure, sure. size size outlier, but just a smart football player that, like you said, yep. Trevor knows how to get open 
And you got to really respect that. And his, uh, he, his like pass catching, I know it's such a weird thing to say. It sounds funny, but just was so much better this year. He dropped quite a yep. few passes the year before, and this year he just didn't drop anything. It's like, so guys putting in the work. It's clear. How many guys you got left? Two. We get, you get two left? Okay. All right. All right. I'll give another two, two. Yeah. So I, I could do them back to back here because one, I've talked about a ton. You don't almost get made your jaw hit the floor. Mo Camara. Uh, from Colorado <laughs> State. No, I was it. I could have put Mo Camara on this list, but I knew that you were going to put him on this list. So I have to do it. He's in my top seventy-five. He's a fire hydrant edge rusher. Very, mm-hmm. very quick off the ball. Heavy hands. Um, definitely needs some refinement with those hands. But I think there's sneaky flexibility. Like I've said here, if you put this guy in a scheme that just NASCAR package, let him rush wide he is going to wreak havoc as a pass rusher. And uh, I will gladly, gladly take this guy in the fourth round and make him a pass rush specialist for me. The other one, and I don't know if he's going to make it to day three. This was my, like, definitely my, all right, am I breaking the rules here? I just don't know anymore. All the other guys, I was like, they're probably all going day three pretty confidently. Do you think Michael Hall goes on day three, a day two of the draft? From Ohio State, I don't know. Um, he's a very one-dimensional prospect. Yeah, he's a, he's 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 a fringe. I think day two, day okay. three player. That's good this enough is, for me. This is, this is this is fair game for me. This is fair. Okay. Game for me. All right. Trevor calls it fair game. So, yeah. Michael Hall, he's a fun watch when you get away from the box score and you you ignore that like he wasn't overly productive. He's not an every down player. He is. I've said it this way before. He's just a middleweight in a heavyweight arena. He is going to rush from shade nose or three tech. He's going to do it well under 300 pounds, and he's always going to have to be quicker and twitchier than the guards and centers in front of him. But he has a go to swim move. He's developed a yeah, the very arm nice. Over, the arm over is is nice. It's vicious, vicious. It's like it'll leave you like matador yes. status. Uh, sneaky spin. And he can counter with the spin. If I have the offense in third and long, I turn around and say, Hall, get the get the hell on the field like this is your time because he can get off the ball. He's got moves. He's quick and twitchy and offensive linemen in one on one situations cannot mirror this guy. I don't want him on the field when there's any chance of the run. I don't want him on the field for more than 35 percent of the snaps. But if I need a guy that can get me off the field, I think that's Michael Hall. Yeah, and that's why, like, I, I, I don't think you can pick a player like that in day two. Now, if you believe that he it's is hard. a full time three technique for you, then sure, yeah, you could pick him on day two. But if if you believe Ohio that State he's didn't a think he was that right, no, and I don't either. That's why I, I, I think he's going to be a like a fourth round pick. That's what I think. So I think that this is this is totally fair game here for for Michael Hall. But I know a lot of people like him because you know that that one gap ability and and the quickness that he has in his hands and to. Um, get around blocks and get to the backfield. I mean, some of some, his best plays are awesome. There's no question about it. My two guys, or do I want to do three? All right, one guy that I'm at least doing for sure. <laughs> Logan Lee, the defensive lineman from Iowa. I don't really know what to do with Logan Lee because he is six foot five and three eighths which is 94th percentile for an interior defensive lineman. And he is 281 pounds, which is fourth percentile (laughs) for an interior defensive lineman. Now you would say to yourself, Trevor, just put him on the edge. He's, I don't know if, I don't know if he's like, if he's got that type of quickness to him though. He is only, he, you, you are only playing him as an edge. If you believe that he's just always going to be in like that five technique role. And and maybe maybe that he, works for him. Yeah. But if you want him to be like a three, four defensive end, you know, like, oh, you don't have to put him inside. Like you, you can kind of have him as this like pseudo edge kind of I mean his wingspan's only 35th percentile and his arm length's only 19th. If you only got three down down defensive linemen, you need length. You need guys right. to be Huge in the middle, and you need them to take up a lot of space. They have these big wingspans to be able to play those three, four defensive end spots. So he's not really that either. However, at his lighter weight, 93rd percentile broad jump, 
94th percentile three cone drill, 91st percentile 20 yard shuttle. So look, maybe he is a defensive end. Maybe he can be a, a five technique defensive end when it comes to um, where his spot will be in the NFL. But I just really like the dude's background. Played tight end and defensive end in high school, two time state champion wrestler. One was as a sophomore at 220 pounds, and the other was as a senior at 285 pounds. So the guy's been just an incredible wrestler at, at 220 and 285, which is nuts to be that skilled and that powerful and to be a state champion at, at a 65 pound difference. I think pound for pound, he's really strong, even when they throw him at, at three technique and he's got to take on double team blocks. And sometimes the lack of length, you know, shows up when he's going up against different types of offensive linemen. But I just love the core strength, love the pound for pound strength. I think that he is a really nice probably like fifth round pick type of a versatile defensive lineman that it would be a great dude to draft and develop. So Logan Lee had to make it on my list for, for so many reasons and, and background being one of them. Have you ever seen how the Rams use Michael Hoyt? He's a 310 pound stand-up rusher. And I just, <laughs> sometimes when I look at Logan Lee, I'm like, could you be Michael could, Hoyt? Could <laughs> and be it's, it? it's, it's not, I mean, he's an effective player for the Rams front seven uh yeah yes. I, so i i love i love you bringing that up because it's it's like what could be he's so interesting logan Lee. yeah and definitely i'm yeah. I'm with you i would i would carry the flag for a guy like that on day three too yep love the wrestling background with any type of trench player uh, i'll give you i'll give you guys two more just as a shout out here bonus um, tip ryman the tight end from illinois zero star recruit coming out of high school played linebacker and tight end out of high school um really just a depth guy from illinois but i think that the athleticism is going to hold him back from ever being like an actual tight end two at the NFL level, but dude's a great blocker. And I do still think there is some receiving ability there for him. He's not just the statue that you can only put in on 13 personnel packages where, you know, he's got no chance in hell of catching the football. Like I think that he could be useful in that regard, but he's mainly going to be a blocker for you. These teams that like to go a little bit heavier, like, I could absolutely see a world where Tip Ryman's getting drafted by the Los Angeles Chargers just in case they're ever going deep on a 13 personnel situation on the goal line or on third and one. And Jim Harbaugh is like, yeah, let's get the beef out there because he can really move some people in the blocking game. So as a depth tight end, as a tight end three, maybe even tight end four for teams, I, I think that uh, I think that Tip Ryman can be that. And then the last one, I'll, I'll shout out the incredible Holker, Dalen Holker, another tight end yes. here who I talk about in our tight end rankings. You know, he's somebody who, Played at BYU for a while. He's going to be a little bit older of a prospect because of um, the missions trip that he went on in the middle of his college football career. But he transferred over to Colorado State and he had his best year this past year as a receiver, but more as just this Swiss Army knife type of tight end. You know, they used him off the line of scrimmage in a wingback formation. They'll use him as a fullback. Or they'll use him in line. They'll use him in the slot. If you can't get Ben Sinnott in the third round, you can get Dalen Holker somewhere like fourth or fifth round. And I think that you'll be happy with that because he'll be able to Better do name. a lot of those same things. Well, I, yeah, I mean, Ben Sennett's a pretty sick name for like a tight end though, but Dale, is, Dalen Holker but is, you, you don't the have incredible Holker name. is it's like true. whatever it's team true. accounts exist for wherever he goes. Like you're, cre- you're tweeting out like the incredible Holker exclamation point, And then you're embedding the video <laughs> of his preseason touchdown in the final preseason game against the plumbers. You got to think of the. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there, folks, watching watching preseason oh, football. That one blindsided me. That wasn't. <laughs> so, I was not ready for that one. Uh, it was. It was, uh, it was it, I don't. So mean yeah, that. Uh, Swiss Army knife type of tight end prospect is, is Holker, and I think that he can yeah make the roster because of a lot of different things that he can do for you, and you can convince yourself like, whoa, okay, if we keep Holker, then. He fills a lot of different needs for us. We don't have to keep a fullback. We don't have to keep you know like this other player like. He could just be a he could just be an all around uh, bottom of the roster dude for us and really help us out make our football team better. There we go. You you didn't have one more, did you? That was it. I did not have a bonus one up my sleeve. All right, I just I'm just making sure that was ten because I wasn't I wasn't counting as. Oh yeah, yeah, I got you ten. There we go. Then that's more than twenty. I don't remember if it's twenty one or twenty two because <laughs> we like kind of, we kind of we kind of mentioned a couple of other players. You mentioned Isaiah Davis from South Dakota State, the running back there as well, but. Uh, yeah, there we go. Those are some some day t- day three my guys. We would love to hear from you guys as well. We've talked so much about the players that you can get drafted in the top 50 or those fringe first-round guys, but we would love to hear you guys in this community sound off on some players that 
you just love. You know they're not going to be top 100 picks, but those guys in day three that you'd be super happy about if your team drafted somewhere at the beginning of day three, um, let us know. Let us know as many players you want. Maybe it's one guy. Maybe it's 10 guys that you have who are for us. We'll take all of them. Best way to do that, youtube.com backslash at NFL Stock Exchange. If you're audio only, you can hit us up on Instagram and Twitter as well, at Tampa Bay Trey, at Connor J. Rogers. Connor, the next episode is the big one. Big I think it's the big one. It's the big board. The it biggest the, of the boards. It, the, 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 the biggest big board of them all. The, the one big board to rule them all here for the 2014, 2014, 2024 wow. NFL draft. I need Throwback. sleep, brother. I need sleep. I, yeah, I yeah, we're saying, <laughs> we've all been saying nonsense, and we don't even like it. takes us a second to catch it. What if four days before the draft we just did, hey, let's redraft the 2014 <laughs> NFL draft? Everybody's like, what is this? You know what's, what's wrong crazy? with these people? Y'all would still watch it because uh, yeah. you guys are addicted and we love you so, so much for that. We truly, really do. But yeah, I think the big board episode is uh, is the next one that we're doing. Um, I think we're going to try to have that one out Monday for you. We'll also have a final mock draft episode for you before thursday's events kick off so that will be we've been doing a lot of what we would do mock drafts on purpose because we've been leading up to okay here is our final predictive mock draft what we actually think is going to happen i think that's probably going to be the wednesday episode for us we will unless connor tells me i'm wrong here because i'm forgetting something we will be live after night one of the nfl draft to recap our entire thoughts of what is going to be night one. Some of you in the comments have been asking about a live stream show. We can't do a live stream show. I'm on the desk for PFF show. Connor's going to be doing stuff for, for, for NBC. So unfortunately, we won't have a live show during the draft, but we will go live right after night one post of draft. the draft. Yeah, yes. as soon as I get post home. Draft. Yes, and then, yeah, I guess I shouldn't say immediately. Post-draft, we, we will do that after night one. No, we will have... We won't do one after night two because unfortunately it's going to be a little bit later of a night and day three starts so much earlier. So what we're going to do is we'll have the night one recap and then the next time you will hear from us will be Sunday morning, I think, Sunday afternoon when we're going to try to do this, have our draft grades for all the teams, for all the draft halls on Sunday. So that's how we were gonna. That's how we were gonna set it up. Right. So that'll probably be published Sunday evening. We think. I mean, as soon as we can get it done, probably. Yeah. But but yeah. I mean, just know when you start your week, you'll have all grades. You will. So you will. We're you will. we're whether, trying whether, to expedite everything we can for the channel. Yes. 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 So yeah, timing might be a little bit different, but that is our tentative plan right now to try and cover this week this upcoming week as best as we can for you but we're super excited we're really excited for it uh connor you got anything else before we get out of here no i think you covered it pretty well we have a fun schedule we're going to be all over the channel before the draft after the draft and then it all starts over again i'm already (laughs) getting like that weird kind of feeling again it's i don't like jumping to new draft classes because i like really putting a bow on this one but mm-hmm. this at this time, I do find myself like, OK, I, I miss summer scouting. It's just a different. It's so different. It's so well, much more relaxed. And I th- and I think I think and I'm with you. I miss summer scouting, too. And a big reason why is because everything is new, right? Every player yes. that you bring up or that I bring up, it's like, let me tell you about this guy that I watched. And it's just that it's the newness of it. Um it is. It Wait is till a you hear about Jalen Catalan. <laughs> I hate you. I hate you for doing that to me. <laughs> you Jaylen Jaylen Catalan, baby. Let's go. <laughs> this is the year. This, this is, is the it. year. This is the one. He's going to become I mean, the Iron Man, and he's never going to get hurt ever again. It's going to look like sophomore year Arkansas. Oh, Until man. then, I'm Trevor Sicken, but that is Connor Rogers. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening to the NFL Saga Change podcast. We'll see you guys next week.